Today on Aspiring Women, life behind bars for a young woman faced with a 60-year prison sentence. I believe I made bad judgment calls, bad decisions, and for many years I, I blamed other people. I blamed, you know, everybody else's part in it, and then I had to take a look and look at my part. Hello, welcome to Aspiring Women. Have you guys ever made choices that you regret? I'm not talking about the color of paint of your bathroom, okay? I'm talking about something big. Well, I say, how many choices have I yeah. made and regretted? A lot of them. And sure. you know, the interesting thing is that some choices have greater consequences yeah, than Yeah, you want to share some of those? Yeah. What are some of the consequences? <laughs> <laughs> some of the consequences oh. I'd rather forget. Oh, I think life is full yeah, of making choices. And, and you know, 2020 hindsight, isn't that what they call it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy to look back and say, I wish I went to, but you didn't have the knowledge, the yeah. information, the life if experiences. If I knew then what I knew yeah. now, but things you know, would have gone a lot differently. Sometimes our, our, our mistakes can be honest mistakes or simple mistakes. There are little mistakes that turn into huge, you know, messes in our oh, life. Yeah. Oh, we, we deal with that on inspiring women all the time. People yes, that make people. one choice and it changes the destiny and direction mm-hmm. of their life forever. That's very true. Mm-hmm. That's certainly destiny. the kind of There's story the word. that we have today. Well, you know, Tammy Fike was only 22 years old, a mother of two young children, when she was thrown in prison on murder charges in 1986. She says she got caught in a spiral of poor choices and curious circumstances. Here's her story. Fight grew up in a small town in southern Illinois, and she was raised in a good Christian home. She was active in her church youth group, but during her teen years, she was drawn to a temptation that pulled her away from her faith. I made a commitment to God as a teenager, and I, I became involved with men. I, men distracted me from, from my relationship with God. I replaced him with a man, my first husband, and that's when I walked away from him. You were married, you had one daughter, and then your second daughter was born, and that's when the problems really started. What were Candace's challenges? When Candace was born, she was beautiful, but small. She was just two pounds and one ounce when she was born and was taken immediately by helicopter over to Cardinal Glennon Hospital in St. Louis and placed in an isolate and neonatal intensive care unit for many, many weeks. When we brought her home from the hospital, she was just four pounds. And she, she required round-the-clock care. And this care included, you know, feedings of every hour. And we had to be trained with this apnebradycardia monitor to, um, to determine if Candace's heart stopped beating or if she'd start breathing. She was precious, but she took a lot of care. And you weren't getting very much sleep. How did this sleep deprivation take its toll on you? I told my husband one night as he was preparing for work that um, I don't think I'm going to make it. My greatest fear is that I'll go to sleep. I'll get sound asleep and I won't hear her alarm or I'll miss her feedings and something will happen to her. And the next morning he brought me home this little packet with white powder inside and um, showed me how to use it. And I later learned that it was cocaine. And, you know, every alarm inside of me went off, but I ignored them. I foolishly ignored them. When did you find out that you were really addicted to cocaine? It started off very gradually. Um, my husband worked midnights, and that was the time that I was most afraid that I would fall asleep. So I'd use the cocaine during the night. And then I found myself using it during the day, and then many times a day, and many times a night. And, you know, I was no match for the addictive qualities of this, of this substance. And it got up to where I had a $750 a day habit. Wow. And there was no way we could, we could afford anything like that. Your addiction added to your financial problems. Can you tell us about that time? We were sinking in debt. With all the medical problems with Candy, I was out of work. I couldn't leave her even for a moment. And um, my husband's job just wasn't paying enough to take care of us. We were sinking. And the addiction on top of it. And um, my husband at that time began to sell the drugs to try to help us out financially. And it was a bad decision. Again, I ignored the alarms that were blaring inside of me. I thought, this is just for a short time. You know, we can get through this and life can go back to normal. I realized, you know, later that life never went back to normal. Doug started to be abusive. 
Tell me about that. How was he abusive? He was physically abusive. He began to strike me. He, I moved out when he struck me when I had the baby in my arms. Mm -hmm. And that, I called it quits at that point. You know, I, the stress was getting to him, too. We went to court, and they placed an order of protection against him, and I moved in with my family for a while. And um, after several months, we reconciled and got back together. What were the terms of that reconciliation? That Doug would stop selling the drugs, that you know, we would find another way to get out of debt. And now, were you actually able to pay off your bills? Yes, we were. Things were looking up. Candy was doing a lot better. Um, she was on more of a inf regular infant feeding schedule, um, and our bills were getting caught up. Even when you were better off financially, you continued to deal drugs. Didn't you realize how dangerous that was? It was, it was hard to stop. We were involved with dealers that this was their lifestyle and we were making them money and they made it clear that it was gonna be very near impossible for us to get out of this, out of this business. They liked the, the enterprise that our transactions were bringing them. Did you fear for your life? At that time I did. I even approached my family about getting you know, financial help to get out of the area. We, I wanted to leave. I felt if we left the area at, and nothing happened, no police involvement or came about towards them that we could just disappear and all of this would, you know, nothing else would take place. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Her statement, I was no match for the addictive qualities, uh, the addiction of cocaine, mm -hmm. and I think, isn't that the truth? Yeah, but we think we are. I mean, people think they can, they'll never get addicted. They can beat it or whatever. It's just they're, they're, they're living in a dream well, world. I think cocaine is so powerful. People yeah. do not realize yeah. how well, it's, it's a psychological drug, too. Yeah. It's not just a, a and physical And she went thing. down to how many, what was it, Shirley? What, 79 Seven, pounds? 78 pounds or something. She bought her jeans in a, in a child's 12 slim is what mm. size she was. Can you imagine she was how emaciated and she was? And nobody noticed this. I mean, you would yeah. think that Where was family her would have spoken up mm -hmm. and said, hey, what's going on with you? What can we do? And the, Run an intervention. And, and the um, sensitivity that we need to have. You know, when others. we turn our eyes away, our hearts go with them. Yeah. So true. And we need to really be uh, involved in the yeah, life. Somebody of should have helped her. Yes. Coming up, Tammy's situation goes from bad to worse when she has a run-in with the law and a man is found dead. The police surrounded our house in the early morning hours and they called each one of us out of the house and the children woke up to not a mommy, not a daddy, just policemen with guns. Tammy's drug habit was about to take over and send her life into a tailspin. Police linked her to a horrendous murder. On September 7, 1986, dirt bikers found Robert Alderson Jr.'s body in a wooded area in southern Illinois. Police say Alderson was shot in the head several times and his body burned. Police were calling it drug-related. We had unknowingly made some, some enemies with the people in town, the regular dealers in this small town that we came from. And Mr. Alderson had come to us for help to leave the area, and he agreed. He agreed to relocate for a while, and we were going to help him move over into the East St. Louis area. And during that process, the people that were going to take him in, they, they became a little paranoid. Most drug dealers are. And um, they didn't trust him, and he reached into his pocket to pull out a cigarette. And I guess they thought he was pulling out a re weapon, and he was shot. How did his death affect you? It was terrifying. It, it was horrifying. This was a friend and he trusted us and he had helped us during a, a time that was very difficult for us. And I couldn't believe that my actions and my bad decisions and ignoring all the alarms had led to a man's death. It was, it was terrifying. Terrible. Did you blame yourself for his death? Yes, I do. I still do. Even though she didn't pull the trigger, a judge sentenced Tammy to 60 years in prison under the Illinois Accountability Law. Prosecutors argued she helped plan Alderson's killing in order to protect her and her husband's drug business. Tammy says it isn't true, but she understands the law. The act of one is the act of all. And when this man shot Mr. Alderson, that, that death was held accountable for me and the rest of us. There were seven of us that were convicted of his death and each of us was sentenced to similarly the same sentences. Was your husband one of those seven? Yes. 
What happened to your husband and your family, your children, when you were sentenced? It was terrifying on the children. When we were arrested, it was something right out of a, a movie. Um, the police surrounded our house in the early morning hours, and they called each one of us out of the house. And then the police swarmed the house, and the children were left in the house and woke up to not a mommy, not a daddy, just policemen with guns. And it was terrifying for them. How old were your children? Four and one at the time. And what happened to your children? Were they permanently in your, your parents' home then? Yes, they were. How long did it take you to get clean? Well, I would say the first three months in the county jail were rough. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I was, I was a mess. At one point in time, they thought about sending me to a drug rehab because they saw that I was detoxing from a substance. They weren't sure what it was. You know, the whole issue with candy and the drugs and what the reason why I took them, that was never brought up in court. It was never allowed in the courts. We were never allowed to tell people why we did what we did. Have there been times when you thought you couldn't go on? Many times. Many times I told the Lord, I can't face another day. I can't face another day. It, was, it has been difficult, very difficult to cope with. And then His grace comes and He lifts me and He gets me through that day. And we just take it one day at a time. Well, that I think that's a bit extreme, personally. Uh, you know, I understand the accountability law, but where is the sense in the middle of this? You know, that's why they say common sense is not common. Yeah, that's because true. Because I am sorry. Here's a young that's very woman, true. a young has, mother, yeah, who has two small children. Yeah, yeah. Where, where is the um, reward in putting her behind yeah, bars certainly. when she didn't even kill the yeah. person? There are people who have actually killed yeah. people who have not spent as much time in jail. The sentence as she certainly is. did not did not fit her crime. Yes, she made mistakes, had bad associations, but this it's right. ridiculous. You know, don't you hate it when, when something happens and you go, something told me. Yeah, a lot. You end up with on. all yeah. these horrible consequences. If you had just listened to that. We were just talking about that, how any one of us could be in that position. And if the circumstances yes. were yeah. right, we uh, any one of us could be there. What I find to be so fascinating mm -hmm. is the number of women in prison has nearly doubled in the last two decades, hmm. doubled. And one-third of women in prison are there because of drug-related crimes. That wow. does not surprise yeah. me. Yeah. That's well, why we need to crack down so much right. on drugs, because look well, at the Well, you fallout. know, it's interesting. Justice Anthony Kennedy said in a speech, he said, our resources are misspent, our punishments too severe, our sentences too long. In too many cases, mandatory sentences are unwise or unjust. I agree. I do, too. Yeah. On this cer in this circumstance, I certainly do agree. Yeah, and some yeah. of them need to stay in there a little longer. Well, I know. <laughs> and those are the ones that get out early. Yeah, That's the pedophiles. Right. It's crazy. Well, up next, Tammy finds hope in a lonely jail cell. Stay with us. I realized I had hit rock bottom. And you know, when you're on the bottom, you have nowhere to look but up. And that's what I did. I began to look up. Tammy, faced with many years behind bars, began the long, hard road to restoration and found a way to help others from inside prison walls. Shortly after her arrest, while sitting in jail, Tammy knew she had hit rock bottom. She was broken, her life devastated. But when she cried out to God, He forgave her. And though she still faced many years behind bars, she took the first step towards real freedom. When you're on the bottom, you have nowhere to look but up. And I began to call out to God. And I, I told him, I said, Lord, here, you know, I've made a mess of my life. My life is a disaster. And here are the pieces of my life. And if you can do anything with it, if you can use me in any way, here they are. And I began to read the Bible. And I then told him, I said, Lord, I don't know what else you want me to do. So I'm going to read this Bible until you tell me to do something else. And I read it and I read it. And for years, he didn't tell me to do anything else. And often I read up to 60 chapters a day of the Bible. And little by little, I began to change. Was there one particular moment in time where you consider it your conversion or your salvation? When I first came to prison, I, I didn't want to live. There was a life and death struggle that took place, and I had attempted suicide. And the authorities had placed me in what we call a strip cell, where there was no bedding, no clothing, no items at all. And it was in that cell alone that I had an encounter with Christ. He was the only thing I had in that cell. I, I felt a burden lift up off of my shoulders. I felt like he entered that cell with me, and he was right there sitting down on that bunk with me and embracing me. He gave me hope, and he gave me a reason and a purpose in life. And 
and made me feel like he had wiped away my, my past and my sins and my mistakes. You decided to enroll in Bible college. The Lord had called me to ministry and I was scared and I ran. I had ran from this call since 12 years old and I told the Lord when I realized that I was facing the call again, I told him, no, absolutely not. I will not be responsible for destroying somebody else's life the way I destroyed my own. And that's when he opened the doors for me to go to Bible college and that's when I gained the confidence to answer his call to ministry. And you established something you call NIP Ministries. How did you name it that? What does it stand for? NIP Ministries is um, Nothing Impossible Prophetic Ministries. He gave me a desire to pay back to society a restitution. And he directed me to pay this restitution to society's homeless. I filed all the documents, paid all the fees, and when all these licenses started rolling back into the prison, they were a little upset. Um, they didn't really understand what was going on, so they placed me in segregation. Here you were trying to follow what the Lord was telling you to do, and you got punished for it. Yes, I did. But, you know, I think that was, an, that was an act of faith. I think God had to let me go through that process to see would I push on, would I press on, would I stop at the first obstacle, would I drop the ball and run, or would I you know, continue to have faith and believe? Tammy, in 2003, you wrote a book, and it's called God Whispers. Mm -hmm. What motivated you to do that? God Whispers was the first book in a series to teach the voice recognition process. If you were to hear God's voice every day, um, before long, in, in the middle of a hectic day when th everything's going wrong that can go wrong, you would be able to hear His voice interrupt, give you directions, give you details of how to work out those problems in life. So my message is just to teach the voice recognition process. Get Call the, the people of God back to the voice of God. How have your daughters coped with your incarceration? It's been very difficult for them, very difficult. Everything that they did in life, they did without a mother. Had their proms, you know, their first dates and their first jobs and everything that they, they have done, they've done without a mother. But I think my daughters have learned from my mistakes and they have achieved greater things than I have. <laughs> what are your da daughters doing today? Well, Amanda's 24, and she's uh, teaching at a Christian academy. Uh, she's teaching first graders. And Candy is in school to be a nurse. What have you learned from your mistakes? Oh, what haven't I learned from my mistakes? I would say, you know, there's never an excuse. There's never a cause to justify the use of drugs. Never. There's nothing that could ever justify that. And I would say it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God loves you and he has a purpose for your life. If you'll just turn it over to him, he can, he can reach down to you right where you're at and give you a new life. You know, of all the stories we've done, I think this one gets to me the most, to think of what Tammy has missed in her life, her daughter's mm -hmm. lives, their growing up mm -hmm. years. But, you know, she is appealing her case. Oh, good. And, yeah, and if she wins, then she'll get out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But if not, she has to spend 10 more years in prison. I just, I, I just want to ask our audience crazy. to pray for Tammy that yes, she will and get out. family and yes. her children, absolutely. Um, you know, another thing I found to be quite irritating, actually, <laughs> is that her husband ended up divorcing yeah. her. Because she's in prison, And I too. said, well, of course he's in prison, but I said, he's the one that introduced cocaine to her. Yeah, and guess but why he, he yeah. guess why he divorced her? He found out she'd come to Christ. Yeah. So he was just twisted and crazy all yeah, the way around. I mean, because it's still another loss yeah. for her. It's insult another to injury. Another rejection. Yeah, yeah another, another rejection. Another loss for her. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's very, very sad. But look what she's accomplished behind bars. She started this ministry, which I don't mm -hmm. think we mentioned before, is to the homeless. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. She wants to help people, you know, that are less fortunate than her, which is kind but of But she ministers to the, to the women there, too, I'm sure. She does, yes. She graduated from Bible school, wow. and she, she has a little ministry right there. And, you know, in spite of her mistakes, God is using her where she She's is. She's like a modern-day Paulette. Yeah, she is in a fall. Right. Yeah, yeah right. Well, she's yeah, writing she's books. Yeah. That's she's, she's writing true. books from there. True. That's right. Yeah. We all live in some type of prison. I was thinking about that watching her. I thought regret, shame. You know, yeah. we all have places we have That's to work through. That's very true. We have some final thoughts when we come back. Stay with us. 
we're hearing a powerful and very inspirational story about a woman who got involved in cocaine and ended up um, being involved in a murder of a man and now is in prison and uh, for many, many years. And, um, you know, my takeaway on this, uh, Shirley and Michelle, so much is that personal forgiveness sometimes is the hardest type of forgiveness mm. oh, to yeah. practice. To forgive yourself, is you to mean? To forgive yourself. Yeah, when I was true. listening to her talk, I thought, you know, her regret. Yeah. Um, and she paid and paid and paid yes. on so many In levels. different levels, yeah. Yes, giving but up God and... wants to forgive us and help us to forgive ourselves because mm -hmm. we all have areas of our life we can look back on and say, if I would have only known, if I would have just had that information. Well, Tammy, I asked her, what was the one thing that you would change? And she said, I wish I'd gotten help with the baby. I mean, that would have been yeah. a simple thing, but it may have pointed her life in, in a, a different, different direction. direction. Right. Yeah. And that's why every decision we make is, is critical, mm -hmm. really. And finding counsel of good people that can help us walk through those times. I have, you know, a lot of times we just don't ask for help. There's the shame factor that makes and you pride. keep saying to yourself that you can work it out and you kind of go along for a while and you go, well, I can fix this. And then it keeps it keeps escalating before you know it. When you're tired and you're vulnerable, you yeah. make that decision that, that changes the course of your life. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, young mothers fall mm -hmm. into that. And oh, that yeah. was another touch point for me. I can relate to having four children under five, being tired and exhausted. I could have easily have done sure. something so crazy and, um, and so difficult at that time. So the forgiveness issue is certainly that she did do a crime and she was involved in something very significant, but yeah. God wants to forgive her too. And she found purpose in her life. Yes. Well, even though she, Tammy, did make some bad choices, she has become a role model. Here's a woman that could have blamed God for her situation. She could have wanted God to come in and rescue her. She could have succumbed to self-pity or bitterness. But, you know, she blew me away, especially when she said she wanted to help the homeless because she was so much better off than they are. She has cultivated a thankful heart in a horrible situation. And she's figured out how to live a life of significance in spite of her challenges. You know, if Tammy can do that from her cell, can't you and I use our blessings and our freedom to make a difference to someone? We'll see you next time.